thank you for joining us and for anybody that is now watching live on social um feel free uh for anybody that's in zoom or on social if you guys have questions comments anything like that to put them in the chat um and we'll make sure that um throughout the conversation or at the very end for q a that we'll get those to john our presenter um i am going to try to share my screen really quickly uh, let's see give everybody who is new which i know there's a few of us today there we go let me know if you guys can see my screen all right you can okay perfect yes we can see it perfect let's see if i can go full screen there we go all right so um our presenter tonight um john igo a partner at Locklord. um he's going to be talking about tech startups and raising capital and next screen so with palm beach tech um our whole goal and mission is to build south florida into a tech hub so um by doing that in part our community creed which is super important to us especially with every, everything that's been going on uh, lately in the community is to let people know that uh, palm beach tech is wholeheartedly committed to building a welcoming collaborative inclusive community for all we put inclusivity first engage with others and are considerate to all and we do not sell to people um, so you can learn more um, about our organization if you just go to southfloridatech.com um, next screen here so these um, are a few of our corporate members um, right now i think we're at like 201 i think is our current number of, of corporate companies that are involved um, across the region but obviously you can see um, these are a mix of both larger and smaller companies and hence tonight's discussion we've got our um, startup companies and younger entrepreneurs all the way through our office depots fpls much larger organizations so i know that we're one of the very few, if not the only, um, uh, organization for technology companies that encompasses all of those. Um, then our next screen. So um, these are some of our events. Um, the one at the top, obviously our Tech Talk is tonight. We do that every single Monday. Um, and for those that have joined us in Zoom, for anybody that's watching on social, we used to just uh, present live just on social, um, more of like a presentation style, but we've since uh, started over the last couple of weeks where you can actually log in through Zoom early. And we're doing that at 5.30. So today we had a lot of wonderful people join us today to just kind of learn more about our community, what people are up to, um, what resources they need just to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, we also have podcasts each Wednesday, our community coffees each Tuesday and um, educational workshops Friday mornings. And at the very bottom is an example of one of our annual events, which is actually coming up. We um, actually just launched this today. Um, our hackathon uh, is coming up October 23rd through 25th. So anybody that's interested in the hackathon, we're gonna be doing something with the theme of coding for good, working with some local uh, nonprofits. And so we're looking for developers, engineers, project managers, any YUX people, um, anybody that just wants to give back to the community, um, we are totally open to you guys joining. Uh, let's see, next screen here. So um, again, for anybody that is interested in becoming a member, we do have memberships for individual people and then also for corporate companies. Um, so obviously these are not all of them, but I listed a few of the different membership benefits um, from a customized member uh, profile on our website, different speaking opportunities, our member exclusive peer groups, and a ton of great stuff. So if anybody's interested, again, you can go to the website at southfloridatech.com um, or you can email Monica and I. We're both just either Monica at palmbeachtech.org or Nikki at palmbeachtech.org. And uh, this last screen here is um, if you're interested in being added to our um, eblast um, list that goes out every Monday, if you just text your email to 561-260-7206, then we can add you guys to our Slack channel and also to our e-newsletters. And I'm going to try to exit from my screen, stop my sharing, there we go. And um, so John, I am going to pass this over to you. If you could um, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do. And then of course, whenever you're ready, you can take it away uh, and share your presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, keep me on time. If I okay. start, Will do. Let, let me know. Um, so my name is John Igo. I'm an attorney with Lock Lord. I've been at this, uh, the practice of law since 1981. Um, and I've been with the same firm. The name has changed over time with uh, due to mergers. 
Uh, so we're a large firm. We have offices throughout the United States um, and abroad uh, and in Florida. We have expertise in all areas of law, but we have the focus on working with startup companies. That's what I've done for most of my career. I represented uh, startup companies, but also occasionally on the other side of the table representing venture firms or angel groups uh, in making the investments. Um, outside of the firm, I've been involved in a number of networking organizations. I helped to start the Gold Coast Venture Capital Club years ago. I'm an early, uh, I'm on the executive committee and a, the board of the Florida Venture Forum. We do uh, two conferences every year and the early stage capital conference is coming up. That'll be a virtual event, October 14th and 15th. I have to throw that plug in there, Nikki. Uh, um, and I wanna thank Joe Russo and Nikki and Monica for inviting me to participate in this happy hour event. I'm going to try to give you a general overview of some of the issues I think are important for startups in uh, organizing themselves and engaging um, with potential investors. So organization, uh, one of the first things you need to do once you've got a group of people, or even if it's yourself and you have an idea and you start, you start to work on your business is form an entity. You want a corporation or an LLC so that you can avoid personal liability. That's the primary reason businesses are conducted in the form of entities. And you have choices. You could form an S corporation, a C corporation, or a limited liability company. And I wanna just hit on a couple of highlights on the pros and cons. S corps and LLCs are what they call pass-through entities, pass-through companies. For tax purposes, there's only one level of tax. An S corporation makes generates revenue, makes profit, and those profits are allocated to the owners. So the shareholders get forms K-1. Uh, the members of LLCs get a form K-1 at the end of the year. So you have to plan to make sure you've got money to distribute to your owners so they can pay the taxes. You can't just spend all the money if you're making profits. Um, that's the, the flow through aspect of S-Corps and LLCs. Uh, S-Corps can be owned by individual resident taxpayers or some qualified trusts, but they can only have one class of stock. You can't have common or preferred stock. So some people will say, well, let's just go to LLCs. Um, and a lot, of, in, a lot of businesses start that way these days. Get your Zoom LLC certificate of organization and you're off and running. Um, however, if your business ultimately uh, raises institutional money from a venture capital firm, they are not going to let you generally remain an LLC. You will have to convert the LLC to a Delaware C Corporation, typically. That has to do with a tax issue. Um, it's called UBTI, Unrelated Business tax Taxable Income, but it is a decision that, um, it, it's a decision point uh, that usually comes up if you grow your company to the point where you need institutional, you can raise money from venture capital firms. Um, I will say, however, that if you're, if you start a business and you plan on having a variety of divisions or subsidiaries, you know, with different types of businesses, then you're going to want to use a holding company structure with an LLC. Uh, so that when you start to sell those companies, you only have one level of tax. So those are kind of the tax, some of the general tax issues you need to take into account in for deciding whether you're going to operate your business as an S Corp, a C Corp, or a limited liability company. With C Corps and LLCs, uh, you can provide equity incentive to your teammates, um, to your employees as you hire them. And this is often important because uh, you don't have a lot of cash to pay people salaries, so they are can be attracted with equity incentives. Although I tell all of my clients to treat your equity as gold and be very careful about handing it out too generously in the beginning, because when the money comes along, you're all gonna get diluted even further. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I won't get into the details, but C-Corps 
can have um, stock options or stock awards. The stock awards are taxable. There's a similar equity interest in an LLC called profits interests. And the economics are actually very similar to a stock option because you, if you get a profits interest, you have to value the company. Say it's worth a million dollars. You get your, your uh, 5,000 units of profits interests. When the company is sold, everybody else who was there before you gets a million dollars out first. It's kind of like the price of admission, like a stock option exercise price. So those are called profits interests. They're attractive for LLCs because you can give them to people right away without triggering a tax. And they start to accrue uh, time on their capital gains holding period. Uh, so that can that can be a very good advantage. One of the downsides of LLCs is the pain in the neck that comes with paying salaries. If you are a member of an LLC and you earn a wage and a salary, you can't have the normal withholding taken out of your paycheck. You have to be treated as a partner. So you get a K-1, you have to pay your own taxes on a quarterly basis. But those, these are the kind of details you're going to consider when you talk to your accountants and your lawyers in deciding the choice of entity, but it's important to, to use an entity to avoid personal tax liability. Another part of, important part of organization is books and records. Now, we can't run your businesses out of shoeboxes anymore, and it's important to start right away. Um, you know, get some advice from a bookkeeper or an accountant as to how to set up your books. And, um, and, you know, a lot, of, sometimes for corporate books and records, we, you know, savvy companies will start right away with a virtual data room. Um, because when you approach investors, they're going to want to see all of your contracts that are in place. They're going to want to know what kind of deals you have between each other, what kind of a shareholder agreement you have. And if you have all of that material already organized and in an in indexed data room, you're gonna save a lot of time um, in due diligence reviews by investors or others. So get organized and stay organized and consider a virtual data room uh, so you have copies of all your material agreements. Another important issue is if, if you're founding your company with partners, um, if there are more than, you know, you have co-founders, is, you know, make sure you understand make sure you understand what contributions each person is supposed to make. You know, what are we gonna do over the next year? And especially, if, you know, you can't ordinarily just say, well, you're gonna do the finance, you're gonna do the marketing because you're all probably doing a little bit of everything, but you have to have an understanding amongst yourselves as to how much time you're each gonna to contribute to the enterprise. And one, one way we address that is with vesting. You know, split the equity up, however you decide to do it. If it's four of you, maybe it's 25 cent, 25% each, uh, but tie some vesting restrictions to that. In other words, a simple example is just time. Let's say four people get together um, and they, you know, they split up the, you split up the equity to start with, but one of the people decides to go surfing in Hawaii for a year and not contribute anything. Should that person get to keep the full 25%? These are the kinds of decisions you have to make up front so that you're not confronted with, oh, now what? You know, Jimmy was doing all the coding and he left. You know, he's got 25% of our company. So consider vesting even among the founder group. Another important topic is intellectual property, especially if you're inventing something, um, and, and including coding. Anyone who works on your project, employee, advisor, consultant, should sign a document agreeing that whatever they do for you belongs to the company. Um, we've seen a lot of problems with this in the past where people will have you know, random advisors helping out developing code with no agreements in place. And then the company takes off 
and they you know look to the lawyers to try and untangle the mess and figure out how we're going to get this person to sign and execute an assignment of his IP when we don't have an agreement in place. Um, so that's very important. There's a standard form most law firms will use of non-disclosure, confidentiality, and invention assignment. So it's, but it's very important, especially if you outsource any of your work to consultants in Europe or India, you need to do the same thing with those people because any investor is gonna want, especially if you're touting your IP, any investor is gonna to wanna to look back and find out every person who had anything to do with that IP and make sure they agree it belongs to the company. Um, for investors, one, you know, we all hear about the due diligence that investors do on entrepreneurs, but it goes two ways. You really need to do some due diligence on a prospective investor or investor group before you engage with them. Um, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of advice online about how to prepare pitch decks and executive summaries and business plans. Um, uh, let me, let me, let me get back to the due diligence. Um, so they will want to see that the investors will want to see a pitch deck an executive summary and your financial projections. Uh, but are you wasting your time with that particular investor? Do they invest in the industry in which your business, um, you know, where your business belongs? Um, will they invest at the level of your company in a startup or an early stage? So you have to do your homework. They expect you to do some homework on them so you're not wasting their time. Um, and one thing I recommend often is look if you if you you starting conversations with a, an angel group or a, or a venture firm, ask them for the phone number, the name and phone number of a CEO of a company in which they invested. Talk to somebody who's had experience dealing with these people, so you can find out um, how they are to work with. What are they like in the boardroom? Do they give you enough you know leeway to? Uh, or are they going to be all, you know, leaning over your shoulder with every decision, that type of thing. And you also have to understand what the investor's goals are. They're looking for a return on their investment. So, um, and a lot of their investments don't pan out. So in order to get the type of return they want, they have to plan on some working and some not. So the ones that work, they're gonna want a very high rate of return. So they're not gonna invest in companies that will show a very small rate of return. So you have to be confident in your financial projections that this, these are achievable goals um, and that the investors will, will, uh, will see that you can get to those goals. Um, I just want to talk, talk a little bit about uh, tips uh, for, for your pitch. Um, keep it simple. You know, don't, if you're, you know, don't clutter your PowerPoint with too much information because whether you're presenting it on a screen in a conference room or on Zoom um, or in a conference room at the investor's office, you don't want too much distraction on the slide, if you want them to pay attention to you and not try to read what's behind you on the slide. So, so you know, keep it simple. Don't clutter your slides. Know your data, rehearse your pitch. That's sort of obvious, but you know, sometimes people don't do it and they you know, try to read from their notes like I'm doing now. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's not a good look. Uh, you, you gotta know your, your pitch cold. And if you're doing it in a group presentation, um, rehearse the a, the technical stuff so that you know that there's not gonna be a glitch when you're up there and a delay trying to find the right laser or PowerPoint or why won't this button work? Uh, that's not a good look either. Um, you wanna identify the problem you're addressing or the opportunity uh, that, you, that you see with your product or service. And you wanna outline your proposed path to generating revenue to get the return. So what's the sales and marketing strategy? And just a pet peeve I have, you know, don't, 
Don't fall into the trap of saying, well, it's a billion dollar market. All we need is 1%. If we can get that 1%, we're gonna be so great. They don't wanna hear that. They, what they wanna hear is your plan for achieving sales. If you, if you have customers already, fantastic, get some testimonials, but how did you get those customers and what's your plan to scale uh, to, you know, what's your true sales and marketing plan? Not just, hey, if we get there, we'll, we'll be great. Um, you know, the toughest thing is how you find the investors. Uh, warm introductions, I think, are always the best. So networking in events like this or other or venture capital conferences, um, you know, getting involved in incubators and, and talking to your peers about who they raise their capital from, all of that is invaluable. Um, you have to get out, you have to pound the pavement, you have to, you know, talk to your clients and try to get to, set, you know, other, other contacts um, because an introduction from a warm body as opposed to a sending a business plan over email is always much more effective. How much more time do I have, Nikki? We are at 618, so we've got about 10 minutes left, um, but I okay. do wanna leave some uh, time for questions, so. Okay, all right. Um, you know, th this, I'm reading from um, an outline of a presentation that was an hour long, so I'm trying to, trying to uh, speak as quickly as I can, but I thought I would tell, talk a little bit about issues that you'll see in term sheets. So if you get to the point where um, you have an interested investor, hopefully more than one, and you're asking people for term sheets, what you see, and uh, if you're talking to friends and family about putting money in, they're gonna want you to put the term sheet together. They're gonna say, okay, well, how much money do you want and what do I get for it? So, you know, that's, then it's, there it's your responsibility. If you um, are presenting to a you know, more sophisticated angel group or to a venture capital firm, they're not even gonna look at your term sheet. They're gonna look at your numbers. They're gonna look at your projections and your plan and they're gonna do some due diligence. And if they decide they really like this company, they're gonna do their own analysis, financial analysis, and they're gonna present an offer to you. And the principal part of the offer is what they see as the current value of your company called often referred to as pre-money value of the company. And that's the key negotiation. You know, if they think that you're, you think your company is worth 3 million and they say, no, we're only gonna give you a 1 million pre-money value and they put in a million dollars, they're gonna get under their formula, 50% of your company because it'll be a $2 million post-money uh, company. Um, that's a lot different than a 3 million pre with a million yielding a 25% interest in the company. So that's the biggest issue, valuation, how much of the company are you gonna to have to give up to raise the capital? You have to understand that, you know, the goal here is not to maintain 100% of the pie, because uh, if you're gonna raise capital from other people, you've gotta give up slices of the pie. The goal is to, hold on to as much as you can and just generate a very big pie so that everybody can make money in the long run. Uh, but as I said earlier, there is a tendency among a lot of uh, you know, young startup uh, companies to, you know, let's just spread the wealth and you know, give 20% to the coding team and 20% to the marketing team. Before you know it, you've, you've given all your equity away. So, hold on to it, treat it like gold. Um, so uh, so other, other terms, um, in the old days, angel investors would come along and, and invest for common stock, just like the founders would. I mean, you'd form your company, you'd issue common stock to the founders, so you're all on the same level. Um, what, what angel investors found was when they did that, they came in and you know maybe they got a million dollar pre-money and they got common stock and then the company grew and then venture 
investors, institutional venture capital investors come along and they take preferred stock and, but they say, you know, we don't like this valuation. So the angel investors get crushed along with the founders, they just get diluted. So what you see a lot now is even with angel investors, uh, their term sheets come asking for preferred stock. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, another path you see is entrepreneurs will say, well, wait, we're not gonna issue stock. We're just gonna give you, we're just gonna sell convertible debt because we don't wanna have the debate about the valuation yet. But once you give us a million dollars and once we grow and we're generating revenue and profits, then we'll be valuable. And when we bring in a venture company, we'll set the value and we'll convert the notes into the same equity the venture people put in. And we'll do that at a discount. That's called you know, basic structure of convertible notes. Um, the safe documents that, that came out of California are similar, um, although technically you don't necessarily have to pay the investors back, but it's a similar concept. Uh, it doesn't, these days though, you don't really avoid that valuation debate because most of the notes or safe documents are convertible at the lower of a discount to what the VC deal is or a cap, a cap valuation. I can explain that in more detail if we have more time, but, but just, to, just to move on, let me just talk a little bit about common versus preferred. And Nikki, hold your hand up if I have to slow down. But the, um, so preferred stock comes in two flavors. In the old days, it, you know, sort of traditional non-participating preferred stock, it was a, a hedge against the downside. You would get say a million dollars of preferred stock. And if the company was sold, you would get a million dollars off the top. You'd get your money back. So if the company was sold at, you know, not for not very much money, you at least get all your investment money out plus a, a rate of return, so a dividend rate. Um, and, but if the company did really well, do you as the investor have a choice? I can get my money back plus that rate of return, or I can just convert it to common because I'm gonna make more money. We're selling a company for $100 million. Well, that has evolved into something called participating preferred stock, which some people refer to as a double dip. You, uh, you give the venture firm preferred stock, the company is sold, and they get their money back plus a dividend rate off the top. And then they have a deemed conversion to common at a pre-negotiated conversion rate. So they participate in the balance of the proceeds. So they get their money off the top and then they participate. It's kind of a double dip. There were some times when the economy was really tough and it was tough to get people to invest and they were, you know, the preferred uh, return was like more than one X you know, one and a half or two X, their money back plus dividends, and then participate in common. Um, we don't see that much in the, these days, but that can happen. Anyway, some of the other issues that you have to address in a term sheet from sophisticated investor groups are control of the board, board seats, uh, anti-dilution rights, uh, that's where that, you know, you heard me mention that they would convert preferred to common at an agreed price. Well, if you then raise money in another deal and it's a down round at a lower valuation because the company hasn't done well, well, the preferred stock will have an adjustment to that conversion rate and they get a bigger piece of the pie uh, and, the, and the founders um, get diluted. Uh, they also will, you'll see, you'll see redemption rights where they want to set up a right to sell the equity to the company, say in five to seven years. And that is simply a mechanism for forcing you to sell the company at some point. They don't want to invest in, and just sit in, a, um, sit in a company for 10 years because they have to return money to their investors in their funds. Um, you know, there are other topics, but I, I think we're kind of out of time and uh, you know, there's, the other topics in general have to do with relationships between shareholders, like uh, restrictions on transfer, rights of refusal, preemptive rights to give people an opportunity to participate in future rounds. If you've got the money, you can maintain your interest. And then on the sale of the company, 
tag along and drag along rights. The drag along allows majority to pull the minority shareholders into a deal and tag along gives the minority shareholders the right to participate in, in a deal and not get left behind. Uh, but I'll stop talking and uh, open it up to see if anyone has any questions, Nikki. Sure, thank you, John. I was just thinking actually, as you were talking, I feel we uh, need to invite you to our startup founders group <laughs> so that way we can we can all pick your pick your brain. Um, we do have uh, a couple questions in here. Um, let's see, this one is from Keith, is when should a company go for a trademark? Oh, it's just possible. Um, you know, some trademarks, uh, you actually have to show that you're using them. Uh, that used to be a, re a requirement that you couldn't apply for a trademark unless you were using it in business somehow, but now there's a statement of intent to use. So the, the answer is as soon as possible. Good to know. Thank you, John. Um, we have another one from Steven it says, how can a tech startup leverage IP or intellectual property to attract investment? And what type of IP should a tech, a tech startup attempt to get first? Well, I don't know if I have an answer to that one. Uh, if I if I had an answer to that one, I wouldn't be a lawyer. I'd be hanging out with Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett. But um, um, I guess I would. I guess my answer would be that what I've seen um, in a lot of transactions is, you know, people um, who have succeeded have usually choose an industry that's kind of on fire. You know, um, I have a no number of clients right now who were in the healthcare IT industry before COVID hit, and uh, they're going gangbusters. You know, one, one client, for example, um, has developed, uh, transitioned some technology he was using for monitoring patients in hospital rooms and turned it into a a screen, a kiosk for admission of people into the hospital. Uh, so instead of having six people taking your temperature on your forehead and, and all of that, um, you, the, the, the screen sees who you are by recognizing your face and takes your temperature uh, remotely. And anyway, the point is, you know, find an industry that's, that's not only uh, growing, but will give you an opportunity for scale. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, and that's, you know, software, everybody use software as, as typically as a path to scale. And you know, once you do that software, all you gotta do is find the users, create subscribers. Um, and um, it's, still, it's still a challenge, but I don't know if I've answered the question, but I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you for, for trying that one, John. I appreciate it. Um, we actually, we're just at time, so I'm going to ask the final question here. Um, this is from Michelle, said, are there any recommendations you would give to those seeking funding post-COVID? Said, for example, has the due diligence process become more stringent? Um, well, it's certainly less person to person. Uh, so the, you know, the virtual data rooms are, are key, uh, very important. Um, I, you know, you're, I think there's going to be generally more and more remote work, remote learning. Um, it's just sort of a natural, uh, I wish I had stock in Zoom, but I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, but we all. Yeah, don't we all? But but you, you think about it going forward, you know, things have changed as a result of uh, COVID-19. And uh, so people are going to be, you know, conduct are already conducting business differently than they were. I feel terrible for all the bars and restaurants, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just had to close. But some of them have, um, you know, jumped all over the bandwagon on delivery. Um, and, you know, they will survive. Again, I probably didn't answer the direct question. I did my best. No, thank you so much for that, John. And um, I, uh, I was going to offer also if you have um, any uh, 
links to information, any one pagers, you know, with any resources that you want to send out, anything that you'd like to get to our group, I can definitely send um, a follow up email uh, for anybody that RSVP'd um, on Eventbrite. And I'll make sure to get that, even if it's just contact information for yourself or your website. Um, okay. But I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for everybody joining. Um, John, do you have any last minute words for us? Well, I, I, I'll send you my contact information. Um, a lot of the topics I addressed in a very general way. Uh, you know, we have canned memos for our clients, uh, our startup company clients. So I can provide a lot more uh, information and more detail um, to clients or, or anybody. You don't have to be a client as long as you get to know me. I'm happy to help you out. Thank you so much, John. Again, appreciate everybody for showing up tonight, staying with us. Um, and uh, like I said, for anybody that uh, is in here in Zoom tonight with us, I will make sure to get you guys an email with more resources and John's information. So thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nick.